Hello everyone and welcome back to the Revisions Chemistry Review Series. In this video, we are going to talk about the atoms. So let's start off with the history of the atom. How did we get the <clears throat> most modern model of the atom? Because we didn't always have um, all this information about the atom. So it really start with, it, it started with John Dalton. Um, it actually started way before John Dalton, but John Dalton was the first person who gave us some sort of um, a model for the atom. So Dalton gave us four postulates for the matter, uh, for the atom. And what Dalton said was that all matter is made up of tiny particles called the atoms, which we do agree with. And then Dalton said that atoms are indivisible. So according to Dalton, there is nothing in the universe smaller than the atom that exists. So this is something that we do not quite agree with now. Um, then Dalton said that atoms of same element are similar and atoms of different elements are different, which is absolutely correct. We do agree with that. And then Dalton said that compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine um, chemically. So this is also something that we agree with. So the model of the atom that Dalton gave us was that atoms are just tiny spheres. So they look something like this. Um, however, um, the research about the model of the atom and just what are the different things that atom might consist of um, continued after Dalton. So J.J. Thompson came next and Thompson did this experiment called the cathode ray tube experiment. And what happened after this experiment was that um, Thompson ended up discovering the electrons, which are the negatively par charged particles in the atom. So based on that, Thompson gave us <coughs> the model of the atom that we currently know of as the plum pudding model, which looks something like this. So the reason why it's called the plum pudding model is because Thomson said that atoms have these negatively charged particles that are embedded in the positive surface. So according to Dalton, we had the electrons embedded in the positively charged pudding um, that the atom consists of. So of course this is not that much similar to the modern model of the atom that we know of. So the research continued and after Thompson, Rutherford came next. And Rutherford is a very, very important scientist in terms of the regions exam because um, for this one, you can say there's kind of like a 100% likelihood that you can you're going to get at least one question about Rutherford on the regions exam. There might be more than one but one is a must. So first of all, you must know what experiment Rutherford conducted. So Rutherford did the gold foil experiment, which looks something like this. So what Rutherford did was that um, they took uh, an alpha particle source and bombarded the alpha particles on a gold foil. So what you should know is what were the observations of the gold foil experiment and then what were the conclusions based on the observations. So the observations that Rutherford made were, the, were that most of the alpha particles coming out of that alpha particle source that were bombarded on the gold foil went straight through the gold foil. So they were able to pass through the gold foil. Um, so Rutherford was able to detect them on the other side. However, Rutherford also noticed that some alpha particles deflected from the source, so they came back, or they reflected in different directions. So that means the reason why they were coming back, that kind of made Rutherford think that there might be something in the gold foil or in the atom that these particles are hitting that is making them bounce back. So <clears throat> based on these observations, Rutherford's conclusion was that atom is mostly empty space and there is a positive nucleus. So you can remember this conclusion using this acronym that we came up with in class, which is ESPN, meaning atom is mostly empty space, that goes with the ES, and has a positive nucleus that goes with the PN. So 
this was the conclusion but then you have to remember why did Rutherford make these conclusions like what in the experiment made Rutherford believe that Adam is mostly empty, empty space which observations made Rutherford believe that Adam has a positive nucleus so the explanation to that is because some of the most of the alpha particles were able to pass through the gold foil that made Rutherford believe that that Adam is mostly empty space okay and because some of them bounced um, or because, uh, bounced back or they reflected in different directions that made Rutherford believe that there's something in the atom that is making those alpha particles bounce back and the reason why Rutherford was able to say that they are um, Adam has a positive center which is making those alpha particles bounce back is because alpha particles themselves are positively charged and in chemistry um, same charges repel meaning they are if they come in contact with each other they are going to go in different directions they are going to repel each other so when those positively charged alpha particles were hitting the positive nucleus they um, reflected or deflected um so because of this model uh, or because of these observations and this experiment Rutherford was able to give us what we call the nuclear model of the atom because now Rutherford said that the positively uh, uh, the positive charge is not just everywhere in the atom in fact it is confined in a very small space in the center of the atom which we call the nucleus um, and then the nucleus is surrounded by the electrons. So this was the nuclear model, which is somewhat closer to the modern model of the atom. So after Rutherford, um, Bohr came. And Bohr kind of agree, agreed with most things that Rutherford said. The only problem that Bohr presented with Rutherford's model was that if electrons are just revolving around the nucleus, or if they are just existing around the nucleus, then first of all, um, they are going to eventually lose their energy if they are constantly moving or if they are constantly evolving, uh, revolving. So they are eventually going to lose their energy and then they are going to crash into the nucleus. So what Bohr presented was that instead of just... Um, instead of just like existing randomly around the nucleus, um, the electrons in fact revolve around the nucleus in fixed orbits that have a specific amount of energy. So the word that Bohr used for those orbits, other than orbits, um, was the energy level. So Bohr said that there are energy levels outside the nucleus and electrons uh, exist in those energy levels based on the amount of energy that they have so the, this was called the planetary model which looks something like this um, this is the model that we are going uh, that we used in regions chem the whole year and that's because we do have a more modern and a more accurate model of the atom however Bohr was is kind of easier to draw and regions chemistry is for the most part based on the Bohr's model so um, um, this is what we used for the most part however we still need to know that there is there was more progress um on the atomic model after Niels Bohr and that came from Schrodinger um so Schrodinger said <clears throat> that instead of fixed orbits we also have orbitals between the orbits and um those are the space by chance of the atoms existing so that creates an electron cloud which looks something like this and so Bohr said oh, sorry Schrodinger said that um, electrons instead of ex uh, existing in specific orbits electrons uh, exist in orbitals um, and they create this electron cloud so a very very important thing that you need to remember because this does show up in a lot of questions is the definition of the orbital so orbital is the area or the space um, around the nucleus where there it's very likely to find an electron okay so remember this definition of the orbital so this was the history of the atom this is all that we kind of know uh, about the atom but let's talk a little more about the atom um, 
please ignore my slides because as you can see i forgot to add animations to like most parts but let's look at the very basic model of the atom so we know that we have this uh positively charged nucleus and uh we know that inside the nucleus we have got the hmm Okay, so inside the nucleus, we've got the protons that have a positive charge, and we've got the neutrons that have a neutral charge. The neutrons have no charge. They are neutral. That's why I'm writing a zero there. So this is your neutron, which is positively charged. The reason why it's positive is because protons have a positive charge, neutrons have no charge. So if you add them together, you end up with the um, positive charge. And then here's your atom then. And so outside the nucleus we've got the negatively charged electrons so i'll just write e with a minus okay so this is kind of the general model of your um, atom so these three things the protons neutrons and the electrons we call them the subatomic particles subatomic particles so Let's uh, talk about some more uh, things about the subatomic particles. So <clears throat> for your proton, neutron, and electron, we already talked about the charge, that the proton um, has a positive one charge, neutron has a charge of zero, and electron has a charge of minus one. For their location, protons are inside the nucleus, and neutrons are also inside the nucleus, electrons are outside the nucleus. In terms of their mass, uh, the unit for mass um, is uh, AMU, which is called the atomic mass unit. So protons have, um, and this is a relative mass. It's not the exact number. So relative mass means if we compare the mass of the proton, neutron, and electron, then proton ends up having a mass of one. Um, neutron has a mass of one. And then electron compared to proton and neutron has a very, very, very small mass, extremely small mass. Um, to a point where we can just say that it's equal to zero. However, remember that it's a relative mass and electrons do not necessarily have a mass of zero exactly, um, or else they just won't exist. Um, but just remember that the mass of the electrons is significantly low um, compared to protons and neutrons, okay? So very important thing to remember is that the identity of the atom depends on the number of protons. So if you're looking at an atom that has like one proton, that tells you that this is a hydrogen atom. So if I give you the number of protons, you can identify the atom. So let's look at how are your elements given in the <coughs> periodic table. So some more information about the identification of the atoms. So we are given this number at the top, which is called the atomic mass. An atomic mass gives us the number of uh, protons and neutrons that are uh, in the nucleus. So <clears throat> if you notice, um, at the, uh, if you look at the atomic masses of all of the elements in your periodic table, you'll notice that pretty much all of them are decimal numbers. The reason for that is because these are the average atomic masses of those elements. Um, so we take into consideration all of the naturally occurring isotopes of the elements, and then we take a weighted average of their masses. And that is the mass that's reported in the periodic table. We'll talk a, uh, more about how do we calculate the average atomic mass in just a little bit uh, when we talk about isotopes. So for now, just remember that the reason why this is a decimal number is because it's the average atomic mass. And then the number at the bottom is your number of protons, and um, remember that this can give us the identity of the atom. So if we are looking at a neutral atom, all of the atoms that are given in your periodic table, they are all neutral. So in, um, in a neutral atom, the atomic number also gives you the number of electrons. So if I ask you how many electrons do we have in a carbon atom, as long as it's the carbon atom, that means it's a neutral atom, um, so it's going to have six electrons. If it's not neutral, then I'll use the word ion. 
okay so if the question say asks you for the number of electrons in an ion then we'll talk about how do we calculate the number of electrons then but if the question just says how many electrons do you have in this atom and it's a neutral atom meaning you're given the carbon with no charge on top that means you're look you're talking about a neutral atom okay so um let's uh, do some practice about calculating the number of electrons protons and neutrons um actually not practice let's just talk about the very quick um uh, way to calculate them so if you want to calculate the number of protons we just look at the, num the atomic number if you want to calculate the number of electrons we once again look at the atomic number as long as it's a neutral atom if it's uh, an ion then again we'll discuss that in a bit and then if uh, for the number of neutrons we take the mass number subtract the atomic number from that and that gives us the number of neutrons okay so um let's look at of course my animations are messed up once again so let's look at the uh, difference between nuclear charge and atomic charge so nuclear charge is the charge on the nucleus as the name might indicate so if i ask you to calculate the nuclear charge um remember that your nucleus as we discussed earlier contains the neutrons which have a charge of zero and the protons which have a charge of plus one so your nuclear charge depends on the number of the protons so if i ask you to calculate the nuclear charge for hydrogen Hydrogen only has one proton, so your nuclear charge for hydrogen is going to be plus one. Atomic charge is the charge on the atom. So if we are talking about a neutral atom, as mentioned earlier, so neutral atoms are the ones that are given on the periodic table, then the number of protons and electrons are equal. So that means the overall charge on the atom is zero because protons are positive, electrons are negative they both cancel each other out the charge on the atom is zero if we have more or less protons then that means we are looking at a different element and if we have more or less electrons then that means we are looking at an ion so your ion is an atom um, that gains or loses the electrons which is why it's going to get a positive or negative charge so of course then number of electrons are is not going to be equal to the number of protons in that case so what happens is that if we have an atom that is losing electrons it is now losing the negative charge because remember electrons are negatively charged so it's going to become a cation cations are positively charged ions if our atom um, has gained electrons, meaning it's gaining the negatively charged electrons. It's now becoming an anion, which is the negatively charged ion. So a quick way to remember cation and anion is that anion means a negative ion. And then cation is just the opposite of anion. That's kind of like a quick way to remember this. Um, so if we want to determine the number of electrons in an ion we are going to add or subtract um, from the atomic number based on the charge so for example if we have a negative charge then that means we have more electrons so we are going to add to the atomic charge for example if i have oxygen with a charge of minus two normally oxygen has eight protons which means in a neutral atom oxygen must have eight electrons so however <clears throat> in the ion i'm going to do eight plus two that means the ion is going to have 10 electrons um if we have a positive charge that means we now have less electrons than the neutral atom so if we have sodium with a charge of plus one regular normally sodium atom has 11 electrons now it has lost one electron so we are going to do minus one that gives us 10 electrons in the ion all right so that's how we calculate the number of electrons in the ions okay so let's talk about the isotopes so isotopes are the atoms that have 
same um, atomic number because they are diastropes of the same element. However, they have different number of neutrons. So here are the three isotopes of three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. As you can see, all three of them have same atomic number. They have the atomic number of six. However, they have different mass number, and that's because their number of neutrons are different. So if you want to write the, um, uh, the way that these isotopes are written um, is called the isotopic notation. And there are two ways for us to write the isotopic notation. So we can either do this, write the mass number at the top, atomic number at the bottom with the symbol, or sometimes you, um, your isotopes can also be written just like this, carbon-14. Very, very important thing to remember here, and this is like the biggest mistake that some people make, is that they think that this 14 is the atomic number. It's not. This 14 is the mass number. Please, please, please remember this. For your isotopic notation, the number written with the symbol of the atom is the mass number, not the atomic number. Okay? So, um, both of them represent the same isotope in this case. Um, it's just that the notation is written differently. So now, if you look back at the three isotopes of carbon, we know that the um, all three of have an, all three of them have different number of neutrons. So the first one has six neutrons because twelve minus six. The next one has thirteen minus six, seven neutrons, and the third one has fourteen minus six, that is eight neutrons. So let's think back about this number at the top that we see for carbon which we said represents the average atomic mass. So this is the weighted average of the mass of all of the naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. So let's see how do we calculate this. Um, we, um, I tried very hard to find like a table for carbon, but I wasn't able to find one for carbon. But here's a different example. If you're looking at the four naturally occurring isotopes of sulfur and besides the atomic mass we also need the percent abundance and here's why notice this very very important word weighted average right what that means is that we cannot just go ahead and do 12 plus 13 plus 14 divided by 3 like it's not your normal average it's the weighted average which is kind of the average that is used to calculate your grade. So you know that your um, homework is worth 10%. So whatever your homework grade is, we multiply that by 10, and that's how we do that for like the other things, and that's how we calculate your final grade, right? So that's exactly what we want to do here. We do need to take into account the percent abundance of um, each isotope, because some isotopes occur more than others. As you can see here with sulfur, Sulfur-32 exists way more than the rest of the isotopes. So the whenever we are asked to calculate the <clears throat> average atomic mass, there are some steps that we follow. The first thing that we want to do is we look at the percent abundance and we um, get rid of the percentage part. So we calculate that into a regular number. So we can either do that by moving the decimal or we can just divide by 100. Either way, for 94.93, we get 0 0.9493. For um, sulfur 32, sorry, 33, we get 0 0.0079, sorry, 76. For sulfur 34, we get 0 0.0429. And then for the last one, we get 0 0.0002. So that's your first step. Your second step would be to multiply the abundance of, um, so, so to multiply these percent abundances with the mass. So in this case, we are going to look at the uh, percent abundance of sulfur with a mass of 32 and we are going to multiply that with <clears throat> the percent abundance of um, 
sorry, we are going to multiply the mass with the percent abundance. So that's going to be these two things, and then you're going to multiply this with the percent abundance, this with the percent abundance, this with the percent abundance, okay? And so what's going to happen is once we multiply all of these things, we are going to get some answer. So I'm not doing the math right now, I'll just say like, you get this answer, this answer, this answer, and then this answer. And so um, we get those four numbers, let's call them A, B, C, and D. So your last step would then be to just add those four numbers that we got. So I'll just do A plus B plus C plus D. And that gives you your final answer. Do not forget the units in your calculation. So in this case, it's going to be AMU, which means average atomic mass. All right. So next up, let's talk about the electron configuration which means, make sure you know this definition, electron uh, configuration represents the number of electrons that we have in each orbit. Um, so for our case, we're gonna focus on the Bohr's model. And um, by the way, your electron configuration is given in your periodic table. Um, so it's that number all the way at the bottom. So, um, <clears throat> Quick reminders that if you're looking at a neutral atom, then your number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So um, if they are looking at carbon because the atomic number is six, that means um, we have six electrons. So um, we just have to arrange those six electrons in the orbits. So let's look at the Bohr's model very, very quickly, which looks like this. So Bohr called the, as I mentioned earlier, Bohr uh, said that another name for orbits is the energy levels because each orbit has a specific amount of energy associated with it. They're also called the principal energy levels. So the energy levels kind of show how far the electrons are from the nucleus. A super, 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 super important thing to remember, please do not forget this, is that as we go away from the nucleus, the energy of the orbits increase. So the energy of the first orbit is going to be less than the energy of the second orbit or the third orbit or the fourth orbit, okay? This is also, there's a very high chance that this is also going to show up as a question. So if we want to calculate how many electrons um, or what's the maximum number of electrons that each orbit can fit, there's a formula that we use for that. It's uh, two n squared. So the n represents the number of orbit. So let's say if you're looking at orbit number one, we just put the one in place, uh, substitute one in place of n, and the maximum number of electrons that we can have in orbit number one is two. The maximum number of electrons that we can have in orbit number two is eight. Maximum number of electrons that we can have in orbit number three is 18. Maximum number of electrons that we can have in orbit number four is 32, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if I ask you to determine the ground state electron configuration, ground state means when the element is in the lower energy state. Okay, so if I ask you for the ground state electron configuration, all you have to do is look at the periodic table to figure out that ground state electron configuration. So for example, the ground state electron configuration of carbon is 2,4 meaning we have two electrons in the first orbit, four in the second. If I ask you for the electron configuration of magnesium, you're gonna look at the periodic table. Um, we see that the electron configuration is 2A2, meaning we have two electrons in orbit number one, eight electrons in orbit number two, two electrons in orbit number three. If you add them, two plus eight plus two, you get 12 electrons because magnesium, the neutral atom of magnesium, has 12 electrons, righty? So this was your ground state electron configuration. Now, if you are asked to find the electron configuration of ions, remember that this one is going to be slightly different because um, ions do not have the same number of electrons as the number of protons. So let's first <clears throat> um, talk about how we make the ions. So we can have cations if the atom is losing electrons, so that is going to be the positive ion, and, or we can have anions, the negative ion, if the atom is gaining electrons. So let's look at your 
Um, uh, let's talk about why is the atom gaining or losing electrons. The reason is all atoms want to have what's considered the stable uh, electron configuration. And that stable electron configuration is found in noble gases. So all of the noble gases have eight valence electrons, meaning eight electrons in their outermost orbit. So valence electrons means outermost are electrons in outermost orbit. So um, we call this the octet rule. Um, if any atom has eight electrons in its valence shell, then that means it has satisfied the octet rule. So let's look at an ex the example of sodium and let's see what type of ion is it going to make. So this is what your sodium atom looks like. We have two electrons in the first orbit. We have um, eight in the second, one in the third. So your electron configuration is two, eight, one. This one has, because it's the stable, um, our neutral atom, so ground state configuration is going to be um, 281, it has 11 protons, 11 electrons. When it becomes an ion, this one is going to lose the one electron because when it loses that electron, now the outermost shell is, or the outermost orbit is orbit number two. And orbit number two has eight electrons. So this one now, has a complete octet. So that's why sodium is losing that one electron. So after it loses that one electron, it's going to get a charge of plus one. And the new electron configuration for this ion is going to be two eight, meaning two electrons in the first orbit, eight in the second. We now have 11 protons and we have 10 electrons. Let's look at an example of this one. The next one is not going to be sodium. This is chlorine. So let's look at a chlorine atom. So chlorine um, has the ground state electron configuration of 287. So two electrons in the first, eight in the second, seven in the third orbit. So now if um, it wants to have a complete octet, the outermost orbit has seven electrons right now. So the easier thing for chlorine to do is instead of losing those seven, chlorine would gain one electron from another atom, from an atom maybe like sodium, which is losing one of its electrons. So after chlorine gains that one electron, um, it's now going to have the electron configuration of 288. It gets a negative one charge and now it has more electrons than the protons. Okay, so let's do some practice with this. Um, if I ask you for the electron con configuration of the atoms and the ions for all of these, for magnesium, the electron configuration of atom is 282. So then for the, when it becomes an ion, it's going to remove, uh, get rid of the two electrons. So maybe I should, maybe I should say this like get rid of the two electrons, lose the two electrons. So now the electron configuration of ion is going to be 28. For sulfur, um, the atom has the electron configuration of 286, so it's a easier to gain two electrons. So now the ion is going to be 288. Nitrogen has the electron configuration of 25. Again, instead of losing the five, it's easier to gain three, I should say, two, three there, and this one is losing two. Okay, so the um, ion is going to be two, eight. For argon, the electron configuration is two, eight, eight. Argon is a noble gas. So because it already has that stable um, valence shell or a complete octet, this one is not going to become an ion. So there's going to be no ionic electron configuration. Okay, so Let's look at um, what happens when the electrons are not in the ground state, when they are not in their lowest possible energy state. So that normally happens. <clears throat> An example of this situation is um, what happens in the fireworks. So how do the fireworks produce all those different colors? And that's because something happens to the electrons they, where they are changing their energy levels. So they're going back and forth between the energy levels and that's how they're releasing those 
um, releasing the energy in the form of that light um, that we see. So here's how that works. Let's say <clears throat> we are starting with this element in the ground state. The element absorbs energy. So for fireworks, we do have to provide some energy at the beginning. So when we provide the energy, when the atom is absorbing the energy, um, this was a quick reminder that your ground state is when all of the electrons are in their lowest possible energy state. So energy is absorbed in this case. Now that el uh, electron becomes excited. Okay, when the electron becomes excited, it's going to move to a higher energy level because now it has more energy than the orbit that it was originally in. So it's going to move to a higher energy level. So that state is called the excited state, which is defined as the state when the um, electron is absorbing some energy and so it moves to a higher energy level. So if we have to um, write the electron configuration for the excited state, your ground state is what you get from your reference table packet. So for sodium, the ground state electron configuration is 281. But if we have, if we have to write the, the ex electron configuration for an excited state of sodium, remember that one of the electrons has to move from a lower orbit to a higher orbit. So in this case, we are saying that one orbit is moving from the second, um, or one electron is moving from the second orbit to the third orbit. So the excited state configuration could be 272. What you cannot do um, in this case is you cannot move an electron from the first orbit to the second orbit because if you do that, you're going to have the electron configuration of 1, 9, this is not what I meant to do. Okay, you're going to have an electron configuration of 1, 9, 1. Remember, when we were talking about the maximum number of electrons that we can have in an orbit, the second orbit cannot have 9 electrons. The maximum number of electrons that it can have is 8. So this one will be wrong. So that's why we are moving an electron from the second to the third. Okay, so... Um, Again, in this case, um, this kind of seems like the most possible excited state, but there can be there can be questions where you can't have more than one possible answers for the excited state. So if it's a short response question, um, just make sure that you are not exceeding the maximum limit of electrons that can um, that in any orbit can hold. Um, when you are coming up with the excited state configuration, if it shows, if it comes up as a multiple choice question, um, you can look for an option where you see an orbit that is incomplete. However, the electron has still moved on to the next shell. For example, if you look at the two seven two, you know that the second orbit must have um, eight electrons but you still see two electrons in the next shell. So this can give you a hint that this is probably an excited state configuration if the previous one is still um, unfilled. Um, this is not the most theoretically correct uh, way to identify the excited state, but it is going to work for you guys um, in Regents Chem. Um, Again, because we are working with the Bohr's model, so when it when we talk about the more fancier model, like the Schrodinger's model, which we also call the wave mechanical model, there are like different things that we have to take care of. But for now, uh, for you guys, this is going to work. Okay, so um, now that the atom is the electron is in the excited state, eventually, remember that excited state is very very unstable. So eventually, the atom is going to move back from the excited state to the ground state. So the, as it's doing that, it is going to release some energy and become relaxed, and it's going to move back to the ground state. Um, when that happens, when that happens, when the electron is moving back to its lower energy level and it's releasing the energy, that energy is what produces the light or the heat. So in this, in case of fireworks, that energy is producing those different colors that we see. So 
this is a super, super, super important question that shows up um, on the Regents exam. Um, we can also, using that light that is produced or the energy that is emitted, we can create something called a bright line spectrum, which looks like this. Um, so the different lines that you see for each element that represents the um, different colors that these elements are going to emit at a specific wavelength or as they are emitting a specific amount of energy. So the question that you can get about this is how is a bright line spectrum produced? And they can also say explain in terms of the excited state and the ground state. How is the bright line spectrum produced? Or they can say, explain in terms of energy, how is the bright line spectrum produced? So please, please, please make sure that in your answer, you include when electron moves from the excited state to the ground state, energy is released in the form of heat or light, which can produce the bright line spectrum. Okay? Um, some other types of questions that you can get on about bright line spectrum um, is that, so let's say I give you this bright line spectrum that you see on the screen for hydrogen, lithium, and mercury, and then I ask you to, uh, I also give you a fourth spectrum, which is a mixture of two of these, and I ask you which of these elements are included in the mixture. So all you have to do is match the lines. Remember that all of the lines must match for that element to be present in the mixture. Okay, so that wraps up this unit. Um, I will see you all in the next